Is it starting? All right, we're live. How about that? Hmm. All right, you know what? It's locked on your screen for some reason. I don't know why. Oh, I did you, you just click on it? You just click on it and then it unlocks? Well, yeah, I think it should because that's there how I go. check mine. So I'm not making a stupid face because I end up on so many fucking thumbnails. Yeah. All right. Well, looks like I got it. All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is a one on one red pill broadcast. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm joined today with Ryan Stone and. Uh, He's been called a few things in the manosphere. I'm calling him the long-term relationship whisperer. We're going to try a new, a new phrase for you. What do you think of that one? You're muted. Ryan, you're muted. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> what the hell did you do, dude? There we go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just realized I had the whole YouTube thing, and I'm hearing the echo, and I'm like, what in the... So I'm searching through 1,800 windows, and finally I see your big head talking at me. <laughs> all right well yeah it's okay. funny though whisper that's a that's a clever choice of words definitely not whispering no you're like the you know you're like one of the loudest guys in in the space that we broadcast in yeah um, you know why right it's well it's a sailor in you right yeah well we had to we work next to 230 decibel chillers and we weren't allowed to wear any hearing protection so i'm basically fucked up oh are you like partially deaf like you have a hard time hearing yeah all navcoms are so it's just one of those things Navcom, what did you do in the Navy? Naval communications. It's kind of a mix of cryptography, communications, signaling, semaphore, and uh, advising captains on if you're in a formation that who has priority and that sort of thing. That was the eyes and ears. All right. Well, let's talk about that for a little bit because I'm because I'm kind of fascinated by military. Um, there's stuff in this like space you can't see, but I but I coined this room when I moved into the house bomber command. I put on these big couches <laughs> with like aviator jacket leather and shit and i've got a spitfire on this wall over here and i got like all these other bombers and shit itemized over here um you know and that coffee table the, uh, you know the coffee table which you can't see right now because i'm standing up so i'll just give a quick peek over there under my arm but um yeah like i actually coined the space bomber command because i've always been a big military guy and i've always been fascinated with that stuff i actually applied to um get into the royal air force when i was 19 because i wanted to fly the harrier jump jet I was actually born in England, but I was raised in Canada, so I could have done it. But oh, I, I was too, it. yeah, yeah, dude. But I was too tall and too blind. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. They got the height requirements because the cockpits are so small. Yeah, like you have to be shorter than five foot eight, and there was no way that I was going to shrink. So that so that <laughs> dream was over. So I had to go to Plan B. But what did you do in the Navy? Like, there's a lot of people that make fun of the Canadian Navy. We're like, you know, what do you got? Like a fifty cal mounted to the front of a canoe? Like, do we have a serious Navy, or is it really just a joke? It's. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Compared to the world navies, we're we're we punch above our weight, but that really doesn't matter. <laughs> I guess is the best way to put it. Like we have what? some of the best techs in the world because yeah. we have old equipment that they're really good at fixing. Okay. Okay. Like our, for example, our communications, we still use rat ship shore teletype. Which, if I know this is really technical here, but that's what we used in the '40s to fight the Nazis. Like we found. <laughs> We bounce HF radio signals off the ionosphere, like similar to a radio broadcast that you think about in the 40s. Okay. Which is great because if the Chinese shoot down our satellites, we still have communications, but most other countries look at us like it's a novelty. Interesting. Interesting. In a recording oh. studio with a with a phonograph. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least we're not relying on smoke smoke signals canoes with F-50 cows mounted on the front with a beaver <laughs> at the back paddling its tail, right? Pushing it, oh. pushing it on the boat, could you imagine? But I know like we get the brunt of the jokes. Anyway, um, let's kind of do your Batman origin story, like how you got into the Manosphere and the writing, because like you got into the Married Red Pill subreddit. Was that was there some trauma that sent you there? Like what was the result of you deciding, oh, fuck, I have to read this you know, community stuff. Uh, and now, and now you're going to moderate it, which, which is something else you did too, right? Yeah, that was, it was a really weird path. Um, I hate telling this shit. Cause I know you saw me from yesterday where I hate the, the, the whining about your hardship thing. So mm -hmm. just preface it now with, I hate talking about it, but All right. I, I took an interest in it before because it was just generally the kind of, like, if you're a guy on the internet, there's not many spaces for you to go that aren't about buying tampons. So, but I never really kind of bought in. I mean, some stuff because I had a bit of a rougher childhood and a rougher dating life growing up. So I kind of understood it. But the big thing was when I got, it started, I guess, when I get hit by a car. So I was already kind of a little disheartened by the military. Like I was saying here, I came in, joined, and they kind of told me from as soon as I joined, like, you got to do this right. You got to do it hard. You work hard because when you deploy, this is when, you know, shit hits the fan. And so I was basically a top student, high performer, what we would think of now as like a, a very high beta. 
Mm -hmm. earned a lot of money, worked hard, played hard, all that kind of thing, because there was always that that focus at the end of the tunnel. It's not about a paycheck. I'm actually going to save lives or, you know, stop terrorists. And we got out there and it was just retarded. I mean, we took the command of the seventh fleet at the time in the Straits of Hormuz down to the Horn of Africa because we were pirate hunting who were doing opium smuggling. But we had done it during cyclone season, which meant that the poppies were growing, so they aren't shipping them. And the pirates aren't going out in the waters because they're too rough. But we got to be in charge, so we took it. And then the different ships kind of fought over, over our command and stuff, and it kind of disheartened me to the thing. So I kind of made a decision. You know what? At least I'm going to give it a good college try, try the things that I haven't tried, and then if I still don't like it, then I'll get out. And that's when I went teaching in fleet school, which I found very rewarding. And the only thing that was left was teaching at a, at a remote reserve unit. So that was why I did the move to Montreal. And once I got there, my first month in town, typical Victoria guy riding his bicycle to work, got hit by a car by some Truline Québécois. <laughs> <laughs> oh, tabernacle. But uh, yeah, so it hit me so hard. I completely forgot my morning. I woke up and I was like, oh, I got to get ready for work. And then I'm like stapled to a board. I'm going, what the hell is this? I guess uh, the wife, I somehow still had my phone on me. I called the wife. I'm like, hey, I think I got hit by a car. And I am and I told her I was at Edmonton General Hospital, which is the hospital I was born in. And it doesn't exist anymore. They tore it down in like the 80s. <laughs> so they hit me so hard, I got born again. <laughs> yeah. So that was pretty bad. I got a lot of damage there. The problem with that, though, was it put me behind on work. And then I had a boss at the time who was really pressuring me to perform. And I kind of set myself up as a perfectionist. So I always had to do perfect. So I ended up cutting some corners to try and get ahead of things, which it was just, a, it was never going to happen. And at one point then they found an opportunity to charge me. And it was right around the time. I don't know if you remember Jeffrey Delisle. Do you remember him? No. He was this Canadian guy who worked at our Halifax intelligence office. He was selling shit to the Russians. So it was kind of a big deal that we actually had our full blown spy network thing going on. And so right about then, everybody was worried about spies. And so with the timing of it, uh, they assumed I was a spy at some reserve unit. You know, I guess college kids personnel records are national secrets. And so they tried to the they saw the opportunity to replace me with somebody else, as well as get some notches in the count. You could talk at cocktail parties about, yeah, we had a spy at our unit, but we got them. But they were so bad at the and I've been. Fuck, I'm really rambling on this one here. Just cut no, me no, off. Man, I'm going no, too this long. is a good story. I'm, you know, I'm excited because <laughs> because I can't wait till you get to like today and why the you know the new website was created. Oh yeah. Uh, okay, fair enough. By the way, you're you're looking like a really bad Japanese movie right now on my end. I don't know if it's the same on the other people's end, but you have like OBS or something running that. Yeah. Should I switch here? Down? I'll switch over to uh, just normal here. I'll try it. Say it because it's. I mean, it doesn't bother me, but it might be annoying to some people going, why do it looks like I'm watching this really bad Japanese movie? There is no bad Japanese movies. There we go. Is that any better? They're going to wait for you to start doing some Kung Fu. I can hear <laughs> you, but I can't see you. Oh, it should kick in any second now. I just switch back. All right. Let's see if it does. It's a gray screen on the bottom, then it goes black when you talk. And now it's got your... There you go. All right. There we go. All right. Uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. So the charge. Now... From my time in fleet school, I've actually had to be on the administrative side of things fairly often. I probably had three or four different students that I've had to be involved in their charge. I was essentially trained as a paralegal with military law, which is fine. But the problem is it kind of teaches you like how the process is supposed to work. So none of that happened with me. I was eventually like left to the wolves, punished without due process. Basically, every story, you always have this one guy you worked with who had a story of how he got fucked over and it sounds mm. so unbelievable. You're like, whatever, man, you're just mm. like a gruff old bastard. So then I essentially got my version of that and I ended up having uh, panic attacks because of it. And it wasn't so much because of the punishment thing. I'm used to that, but your due process, but it was the uncertainty. Like the whole time it was like the Damocles sword thing. And so mm. I ended up being a heavy drinker. I ended up on SSRIs, which I know you have experience with uh, anxiety meds too. So I think you hate them as much as I do. No, I've actually never taken anxiety. Actually, no, wait, I did. I remember I had to sue this guy once. Um, and I was so anxious over dealing with this guy in court. Like I wanted to, like, I literally wanted to kill him. Like he ripped me off for something like three grand, which today seems like no money, but I, at the time, at the time it, it was like important. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was so anxious about dealing with the matter in court because I was representing myself. Um, I actually went to my doctor and she gave me this like, uh, like kind of like a chill out pill. I can't remember what it was. Ativan? 
I don't know, but it worked. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah, it, it kills. It levels off the highs and it levels down the lows. So yeah, but any of those makes you like a zombie. Yeah, but I've talked to guys a lot on on coaching calls the last um, couple months, and you know, there's a lot of dudes that are on antidepressants, man, and that really messes with you. Like it messes with your sexual function, it messes with your endocrine system. Like it makes you numb. Yeah, basically like a zombie. I think that's how my wife referred to it. She said she hated it because I was just like a zombie all day. Oh, okay, but and yeah, it and messes then, with your weight too, right? Oh yeah, I was probably up to two ten by the end there. It was annoying. Although I think the booze had a hand on that too. Yeah, that doesn't help. A lot of empty yeah. calories there. But anyways, yeah. So I didn't really have any support networks around because you know they were all way back in Victoria, and everybody here just assumed I was Jeffrey Delisle version two, even though there was like no basis for it. I never. Oh yeah, to put this straight, this was like a, a false accusation. I guess just in case anybody thinks I am trying to hide some Russian novelty shit. <laughs> <laughs> And I guess it was at one point, and it was about a year in, and I finally got my interview oh, interview with the, the military police. And I thought, wow, this is supposed to happen like two days afterwards, and you guys took 12. And I sat there, and I realized that they had just been fucking around. Like, it just was sitting on desk after desk, and nobody had touched anything. Mm -hmm. so I was basically put in this personal hell for no reason. And at that point, it kind of flipped the switch in my head. There's a little side thing on this too, but I'll get to that in a second. Mm -hmm. So I flipped a switch in my head. I realized that nobody's going to give a shit about me except for me. And so I ended up taking taking the fight back. And so I took all my paralegal knowledge. I upped it as much as I could. I finished. I was working on a second degree at the time. So I doubled down, was taking like 10 courses a semester. So I essentially from five in the morning till 12 at night, I was just working on my case and on my education. So that way I could be on good footing because I was pretty much done at this point. So I eventually got everything thrown out i got a nice non-apology sent to me by the captain of the unit where and it was actually probably the most the piece of correspondence i've gotten from the military that's made me the proudest he essentially spent the first half of the letter in an official capacity uh calling me an asshole mm -hmm. and then the second half was saying but he's desperate and he really needs me back because they have so much work and nobody else can do my job and i don't know why but it gave me like a sense of pride to say like even though I can't stand him, he can't stand me. He actually needs me there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I so I, I framed sure. it and put it on my desk for my uh, last year there, which was kind of funny to watch the officers come in and then start talking to you. And then they stop, they look at it, and then they kind of like awkwardly pretend they didn't. Like, Got whatever, it. there was my little revenge fantasy. Um, Got it. But Got the, it. So that was part of it. And then the other half of the unplugging was, and this is something I kind of learned in retrospect from how my stepfather dealt with hardship. So we all know that when you're when you're at your lowest is usually when a girl tends to lose attraction for you and look at her better options. Oh yeah, there's nothing there's nothing better to, than getting kicked while you're down, right? Yeah. So and I didn't make it any better because at the time I was really not a pleasant person. So we really are our own worst enemy sometimes. That we're at mm -hmm. our most unattractive when we kind of need to be the most attractive. What do you think of that line that I use a lot, where I say, you know, people are masters of complicating their lives, and then they try to justify why they do it. Oh, dude, I like yours. It's a more eloquent version of my stepping on your own dick line. Yeah. yeah. Self-sabotage is like the worst thing for us, all of us. And like the amount of rationalization people do over their self-sabotage is just bonkers to me. Yeah. And the smarter they are, the more they 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 do Try that rationalization, yeah, yeah. which sucks. Those are the ones that are most have the best ability to get out of these situations. Yeah, that's amazing. Like, yeah. So yeah, yeah. And then, okay, so oh, you sorry, got uh, by the military and then you kind of. Yeah, and at the time, the girl, like, I won't get into details on camera here, but uh, essentially, it was going to be a branch, branch swing, but we were saved, not by chance, but by or not by choice, but by circumstance. And mm -hmm. so I basically went cold, had a hate fuck in the shower, and then at that point, just went balls deep into red pill, becoming my own masculine center, fought everything off, and then decided after this, it's time to start living for me. That's when I left the military, joined up, and then... I took the attitude of it's a take a penny, leave a penny jar. So mm. everybody had sent me all this information. So I started writing down all my stuff, what I had been doing, sent it back. And I'd been doing it so much. They're like, yeah, we need another moderator. And you basically post more here than any of us. So did you want to take over? And then that's how that got. Mm. And then again, from that, and that was when Rollo and Anthony invited me down to 21 convention back in 2017. And I'm like, well, in for a penny, in for a pound. So then <laughs> went there and started doing it live. And then at and this I'll, point, it was just, yeah. At this, and that was a good talk that year. Is that available on the 21 Studio site now? It is. I actually sent that out in my email yesterday and today. Yeah. Where people can lock that. And they can even show, because uh, Joe Navarro was on that same year, which is an awesome talk. I recommend you guys sign up and see it. Yeah. 
But uh, he was talking about the different body language people use to show their emotional states. And then you would, I would go back and watch mine and I'd see, oh yeah, he called that, that, oh, yeah. and that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was really yeah. neat. It was really good. So if you guys don't know this already, uh, Ryan Stone has his own YouTube channel. He's put out a few videos now. It looks <laughs> like he's uh, committed to it. And he's doing red pill plus cooking, which is an interesting mashup because you know when I started my channel, it was like, Let's hang out with entrepreneurs and their cool rides. So it just goes to show you that that you can have like two unique niches and let them have kind of idea sex and mash them up and turn it turn it into a new sort of product. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I still do a lot of my videos in my car where is just because that's where it kind of all started. So Dude, Ryan I love Stone, how you do that about you. Yeah, yeah. So Ryan Stone on YouTube. So go check it out. Um, he films a lot of this stuff in his condo. You get some cool B-roll from the city in the background. Um, yeah, definitely check it out. I really like what you're doing with that and I've enjoyed them, but keep, but keep going on with this like story that you're telling about the origin of rhinestone. Yeah. Oh, and, uh, yeah. So next part of it then after the 2017 speech and it's something I noticed is really cool between 2017 and 2018, which I was still like, I'm still doing my corporate thing. This was more just like a side hobby because I just have interest in the subject matter. But, uh, the 2017 one. The first day we got there, everybody was sat down in the in the lounge and they were having their, I call it their testicular cancer meeting. So everybody was just, <laughs> yeah, everybody was sharing stories. It's okay, you can cry now. What did your wife do? Oh, she left me and took the kids. And what about you? Oh, she was bipolar. Like every girl is bipolar. <laughs> but everybody's just sharing. It's like it's a cathartic team thing where it's like, hey, we can cry together. We're men now. And I was like, ah, oh, I fucking hate it. It was awkward as shit. I didn't like it. And then uh, it was cargo shorts and graphic t-shirts throughout the whole audience. And I don't want to shit on them because, I mean, they paid good money to be there and they got a bunch of value and they were generally good dudes. They just this was the first time anybody had been given direction like this. So it's kudos to Anthony. He really did put together an amazing thing. And you could tell because in 2018 and you were there, you saw it. Yeah. All of a sudden, like the body mass index dropped 10 points in the audience. The clothes opt at least two or three different levels. Like the whole crowd, you could tell they had worked out and got their shit together over the last 12 months mm -hmm. for a lot of those guys that were there. There's even one guy, and I love this guy. I, I don't want to say his name, but he's one of our one of the followers on Twitter that we engage with often. Last year's speech, uh, he came in. There was me and then Hunter from 9 until 11. And then right after that, he comes over and he starts saying, hey, guys, I'm sorry I missed your speech. I was looking forward to it. It was really good. And he had like this puppy dog stare like he was trying to get something off his chest. So we're just like, yeah, what's up, man? And I guess his story was he was kind of embarrassed because he didn't pick up a girl the night before, and so he got a hooker which whatever. But then he was kind of looking to us like he needed us to like tell him it's okay. And at that point, I'm kind of like, don't worry about it. Like, fuck, you do what you do. You don't have mm -hmm. any, you don't have to answer to anybody else. And then he was there 2018, dressed way better, dropped a ton of weight. He was actually charming and he was hitting on girls outside. So like you could really see. Oh just, yeah, the I, SMV of that, of that auditorium went up at least one or two points in one year alone. So yeah, I mean, when like guys, when we announced the early bird tickets for the 21 convention, don't ooh and ah about it. If you're serious about up in your life, then definitely grab a ticket from whoever it is that you're following because the price goes up over time and it is well worth what you're paying for it. But um, sorry, sorry to cut you off. I just want to acknowledge the super chat real quick. Um, I'm seeing them, them come in. I'm going to deal with that after Ryan's done with his Batman origin story. So keep going. Oh, I think that one's it for now. I'd rather talk about these super chats. These guys are the ones that keep this thing going. So yeah, okay. Well, we've got Clarissa Smith. So th the way that I'm doing this now with the um, chat section is I've it, like I find it super distracting trying to have a conversation, um, either one on one or on a group panel. And there's like there's a lot of chatter back and forth, and often there's a lot of trolls that are just a real pain in the ass, and you have to deal with moderating them and deleting their comments. So what I did was I just ticked a box that said um, to comment, you have to be a community member now. So you can see Clarissa is a, a community member. She also donated a super chat, so thank you for that. And it and it lets me find like real genuine people that want to ask real genuine questions to you know me or the or the guests that I have on. So she says, "What advice would you men give to younger?" She says, "I'm 25, feminine, rational sisters out there who are seeking a LTR with masculine alpha men. I haven't found many my age. Thanks." So she's 25. She's feminine. She wants to find a masculine dude around her age. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's a picture of her there, but she looks pretty cute. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, she's nice. It's hard to tell. Well, uh, I was uh, from the age of MySpace. So you can never tell. Well, but I'm sure you know, she is. Yeah. <laughs> but, let's just oh, yeah, assume so, it. So let's just go with what we got there. So what do you think, Mr. LTR Whisperer? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, from the girl side, 
one of the other red pill girls that was a huge fan of mine back in the Reddit days, she was about her age and she didn't seem to have a problem with it. The big things I would say are she's not going to find one her age. I don't think there's many guys who are 25 and going to be the kind of long-term relationship 25 year old. And the ones that are, she probably is not going to want. Yeah. You probably want to go older if you're 25. I mean, yeah. Like for example, my wife, she's eight years younger than me and it's been, it's been a nice pairing because you know, guys are immature or whatever and girls are happy. Yeah. When they're younger, I would say aim five to eight years older. And I mean, there's obviously the, you got to stay out of certain areas. If you're in a bar, you're not going to find it. If you're in a church, you're not going to find the guy who gives you tingles. If you're in the bar, you're not going to find a guy who gives you comfort. The problem says, with the workplace now, me too, that kind of throws it off. It's really a hard position to be in. And I don't well, envy yeah, it at all. It's, well, it's scary for men. I mean, you could work in a high, high profile, successful role where you have exposure to many you know, 25 year old, you know, Clarissa Smith, but mm -hmm. you're afraid to even say hi to them or have a conversation because of this whole me, me too stuff. So I think, you know, to kind of top off with what Ryan was talking about there. Yeah. You know, you want to demonstrate that you're, that you want a feminine masculine man. Uh, so if you have, you know, face piercings or short hair, grow your hair out for crying out loud, you yeah. know, look like a feminine woman, you know, dress like a feminine woman and, you know, just, just approach it from that perspective. She goes, how old should I go? And it's like, it doesn't matter. Like, how old are you attracted to? You know, if the dude's 30, if he's 40, it doesn't matter. You know, just, just go with what you dig. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, guys usually date younger anyway. So, you know, date a little bit older and, you know, see what you like. But at the end of the day, I think you just want to be clear on what it is that you're looking for. Ryan, I want to come back to you because you were talking about the, um, yeah, man, I want to put you on the spot because I don't think you really talked about this anywhere yet, but this is like your, this is like your first go at this as a full-time job. Do you want to? Yeah. Do you want to hit on that a little bit? Kind of tell the, the story behind. Oh, that one, that story is kind of crappy. It's just uh, right after 20, the 21 convention in 2018, I got laid off. And so I got a wonderful position where they gave me a crazy good severance package. And so the next eight months, it's either give it a shot to do it full time. And then if not head back to nice corporate life. What do you think of it so far? Dude, it's at first I felt lazy. Like I was still pulling eight hours, a straight effort in every day, maximizing this, minimizing that, doing whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's weird. Like I'm used to the corporate and military environments where it's a lot more effort and uh, make work tasks, I guess, in lack for a better term than what here. Like everything I do here has a purpose and there's something I get immediate feedback and it's a very strange place for me. I've never seen this before. I could see why you're always so happy on your, on your, uh, on your GoPro in the car there. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a whiteboard in your office? No, I don't. I had an electronic one, but the, uh, the like I've got that set up there. So that's my whiteboard. So I just Ooh, keep that's it, nice. you know, by the side of my desk and, you know, like I've got my to do stuff, like my content to create on, on one side, basically. And the other side, I've got like my top three things I got to do for that day or for that week. Um, because I know one of the things that I end up doing, you know, working from home a lot is just, you know, you're like, oh, fuck, I'm home again. You know, like I'd like to see different four walls sometimes. So, you know, I break up my day, like I'll go to the gym in the middle of the day or I'll do other things. But um, yeah, I find it's 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 tough when you transition from corporate world because I I did that. It, it was um, how, how old was I? I was about how long 30. were you? I was about 30 because what had happened was I was working in the credit credit and collection space. I was working for Equifax and then that sold to an Indian company that turned into a different kind of call center that focused specifically on uh credit and collections and outsourcing and first party contact and stuff like that. And they gave me a package because I had this French Canadian boss that um, he was an asshole and he always used to poke. <laughs> yeah. You well, said French Canadian. Well, you know, French Canadian <laughs> and you know, he knew that, you know, my back, you know, my background was uh, British and the guy always picked on me for some reason. I'm not, I'm not sure why, I guess, I don't know, maybe I was a threat to him or something like that. And, um, Is he a separatist or I don't know. He was just, he was just, just one of these, asshole. he was just one of these tough guys, you know, his dad, you know, he came home from school one day and he found his dad hung in the shower with a noose around his neck. Um, you know, he didn't have the greatest childhood, but whatever. Um, anyway, so I got packaged off when I was 30 and I don't know, man, I just, I just kind of fell into doing what I was doing by accident when I was doing my taxes. Cause my accountant wanted to reduce some credit card debt for a guy he was trying to get a mortgage for. Yeah. And I negotiated settlements for it. And he's like, good, just charge a fee. And I kind of turned that into a business. So it worked out really well for a long time, but, but, but kind of doing this, like we do where we create content for, for men and, you know, to some degrees, you know, the, the ladies that are like the flies on the wall, they like to hear what men are talking about, you know, the male space. Um, 
it's different, man. You know, there's a yeah. big appetite for it. Like there's a lot of guys out there that really don't know how to function. And it's interesting because your because your point of trauma that that sort of red pilled you came from the military. Like it wasn't some girl oh, yeah. broke your heart or you got divorced and you haven't seen your kids in seven years or anything like that. No, it's uh, the meritocracy. Yeah, yeah. You know, which is different for most guys because most guys that come to the content that we create are usually there as a result of some type of trauma. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, that's really cool. So yeah, that just same thing. It just all of a sudden the opportunity presented itself and you just took the reins and it worked out well for you. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, you just have to keep going, dude. It's like I'll, you know, a lot of people will think that it's that it's easy or they'll think that it's too hard, but there's not a lot of guys that'll do it and get in the ring and actually do it. I mean, you always have these like, you know, trolls that end up in the comments that are like these fucking keyboard terrorists. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, get it's... in the ring, man. G get in the ring, turn on your camera. Let's see what you got to say and let's judge your life. You know, let's well, see that's the thing. Your whole, every time you succeed, it kind of, it reflects on them as their lack of success. And so naturally it's easier to just shit on you than it is to go do their own thing. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. What have you what have you taken away from um, starting up the YouTube channel so far? Like you've like you've put out a few videos and they're quite good. I mean, like what have you learned about it? Oh, little things. I haven't done video editing since probably 1999 when I had to do a college video. That's hard, eh? How long does it take you to put out one video? Like what's the editing time? That was once well, the first one took about two days with the editing all together because I was still getting back on the learning curve. Holy but now that I got a system together, it's 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 calmed down where I could do if I were to do it straight through, I could probably go from filming to a finished project in about a forenoon if I really buckle down into it. Four hours, eh? Yeah. And that's what, like a six minute video roughly? Yeah, six to 10 minutes. It all depends. Most of the time it depends because I mean, like the salsa is fairly straightforward. So yeah. I had a time lapse of the, the peppers cooking or, but like if I do something like an omelet, which is you can't make an omelet take longer than five minutes. Yeah. You really have to, you yeah. And then, so the pro do you want to know the process? I'll go through that quick. Yeah, like I'm like I'm curious about your approach because I want to talk about mine afterwards just out of comparison. Ooh, I, I just I just want to thank uh, notes. Yeah, uh, thank the new member here. We got uh, Jeff that just joined the membership. By the way, guys, if you want to chat in the comments, uh, there's a join button which is over by the subscribe button. You can just click that for four ninety nine. Uh, seventy percent goes to the creator. The rest of it goes to YouTube. YouTube news hosts this stuff, so you know helps them grow their business. They haven't made money in a few years, so help out YouTube. <laughs> Damn straight. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. Like that pitch. All right, Ryan, yeah. carry on. Yeah. So yeah, yeah the process for. So the process, concept. I know, what was it? Five to 10 seconds is the most time you're going to have somebody's attention for on the internet. I think yeah, it's like closer to three. You've got literally five to 10 seconds before they decide to click away from your video. Right. So five to 10 seconds is when I add the hook. Usually it's, uh, and that one was just me sitting down and then something interesting happening. So dogs will jump on my lap. I'm drinking a coffee and they'll be like, oh, what's that? Have the text roll in, like my name, the topic. And I try to keep the topic witty, like alpha, beta, salsa. Mm -hmm. The idea is then you talk about that and talk about this. So keep that to 10 seconds. Then the the up to the 30 second point is when I assume I've got the hook. So in there I put, I split it up between a finished product so people know what they're in for, you know, show them what you're gonna tell them and then tell them. Then next part is the ingredient list and then the cooking section. Now the cooking section is supposed to fill the first three minutes, 30 seconds, at which point there'll be any kind of time-lapse time. So if it needs time in the oven, if it needs time to cook or to bake or whatever, that fills up that, which gives a solid minute of quiet time, which is going to be good for the speech later on, because that's when the meat of the conversation happens. And then afterwards, it's the 30 seconds of prep time, and then 30 seconds of me eating it and going to sit back down. And that's when I set the 21 second, I think you gave me this advice, have a 21 second kind of paused section to do your index cards. Yeah, for the end card, so you can put the links there. Um, so it's good. It's it's very structured. And then what I do is I once this is all together, I edit together. I see how long the time is. I multiply yeah. that by 150, which is the average cadence of somebody's uh, ability to speak. Yeah. And then that gives me an approximate word count. So I Got type it. up how I cook. And then I use the remaining words to talk about whatever red pill concept it is. Got and, it. I'll one, and I'll do a first run through the video where I'll start talking about the cooking. And then as the breaks happen, I fill those in with the, the red pill language. And then on the second reading is where I create the flow. Because now I have the structure. And so if I can find a, a pithy way to take like cranberry sauce into talking about setting your boundaries, then I'll put those little interjections in there. And then that'll be the final read. That's the one that goes recording. And then it just goes live afterwards. Okay. And I'm just going to put your YouTube channel uh, in the comments. I want to thank new members, Dan M and double A and Jeff. Hey, hey. 
Thanks for joining up. If you guys have questions that are members, you can post them in the comments. Happy to uh, address them. Uh, Ryan's got like 540 subscribers on his channel, and really, you should have like 500,000. Uh, so well, it's only been three weeks. Is that? Wow. I have no idea if that's good or not. Well, let's see if we can get you closer to 750 today. So there's 388 people watching right now. Click that link and uh, subscribe to his channel. Um, yeah, and AA says, hey, Richard and Ryan, uh, you got me pitching and rewarding your time and efforts. Thanks a lot for the support, man. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, you know what? This makes moderating the comments so much easier. I really I was like I going to say, this is not a garbage fire at all. It's no, amazing. This is, you know, this is great. You don't have to play whack-a-mole. Somebody says some dumb shit, and you're like, pop, delete, you know? <laughs> Every, every 10, 15 seconds. Um, hey, man, yeah, so what how do you, you want do to... yours? Oh, okay. So, okay. So back to mine. So I try to keep mine as simple as possible. Uh, I use Windows Movie Maker mm -hmm. and it's it's free software. I think it's been around for like 15 years. Yeah, like yeah. people laugh when I tell them that I use Windows Movie Maker because it's <laughs> like a basic fit. Um, but I use it intentionally. Like I, like I have uh, Sony Vegas, my uh, computer guy, when he built my computer, I said, give me like a high-end video editing like suite. On the computer, so so he puts uh, Vegas in there with all the you know bells and whistles and everything when he does the build, and um, I couldn't figure it out, man. I spent like two <laughs> days, and I'm like, this is retarded. I mm -hmm. I am I am not made for editing movies, but <laughs> I but I love talking about ideas, so I just keep it simple. So my theory with my content creation is GoPro on the windshield, lav microphone so the audio is clean, so the engine doesn't drown anything out of the road noise, uh, and just talk. And, you know, from my home office studio, you know, a good quality microphone, a, a, a 4K uh, webcam with some good lighting, you know, like around me in a good studio setup, it works. And I just kind of talk. So I do stupid talking head videos is what I call them. I just call them talking head videos, um, which are not that hard to put together. So it usually takes me, dude, when I started, like how many takes did it take you to record? Well, you, you don't talk to the camera, like you do voiceover, right? Yeah, I do voiceover. Yeah, okay, so, when so I think it, it, camera, it's a benefit because I have it written down in front of me and I just have to read the lines that I wrote. Yeah, yeah, because when I'm talking to the camera, I remember the first few videos, like sometimes I did 30, 30 like shoots. Oh, dear God. And I was like, oh my God, this is like, this is like a lot of work. And then I was thinking about the editing component. So I just do it in, in one or two shoots now. If I find that it takes me more than two tries, I'm like, fuck it, it's not worth talking about it and I'll just delete it. So like I've got at least 500 uploads on the channel yeah. now. And I probably put out about 1,200 to 1,500 videos. A lot of them never make it because I just delete it. Um, and then the edit's very simple. I just try to cut out as many ums and ahs and I put the end card and um, that's really about it. And then it's just the upload and then you put the cards and the description of the tags and it, it's pretty easy. I'm gonna say from start to finish, takes me an hour tops. Oh, um, wow. If I do a... And that includes the waiting time for the uploads and the rendering and all that sort of stuff. Um, if I do a voiceover, like a video request, like I do these video requests where people uh, make like a PayPal donation for hundred bucks for my website and they have an email and I just read it out and I just respond to it. Um, those can take me an hour to do, maybe a tiny bit more. Right, But so you don't um, do script at all. It's just like you take your topic and you just kind of go. Right off the cuff, yeah. I don't, I don't like to script my shit. I mean, I do some premium content for my men's community, and what I do is I usually have talking points. So mm -hmm. if I want to cover something like, um, you know, like a mate switching study, for example, which I did a few months ago, uh, you know, AKA monkey branching, um, I basically took this uh, clinical psychology um, assessment. It was like a university study, and I kind of broke it down, and I had the main talking points on an Evernote screen to the right. And that's how I kind of talked down that one. So I so I put a lot more production effort into those ones. But most of my videos, it's just I'll just have an idea. I, I maybe sometimes make like a, a note of two or three or, or four main talking points and I just rhyme. Interesting. I was gonna say that study too, that one sounds familiar. Is that the one where they talked about how 80% of guys who cheat still stay with their wives, but about the equivalent amount of women are actually doing it to to trade up? Um no. Or it depends it was... that whole sexy sons theory thing, or it goes against that. Yeah, like it talks about a few things in and around that. There was um, um, there was a lot of research that was done around why women's uh, interests kind of wane and go outside of the relationship and mm -hmm. how they strategize, um, you know, the switch from one mate to another. Like we know most women have a plan B. Like 
I think it's something like 50 or 55 percent of women have like a backup plan guy that they would monkey branch yeah. swing to that kind of keep as an orbiter, but it's like a distant yeah. orbiter. It's not enough like, that it's safe to assume. Yeah, yeah. It's not close Earth orbit, but it's kind of like the outer planetary orbits. You better not come to my house and have dinner at my fucking house or you're going to be the second choice, you motherfucker. <laughs> Usually it's not. Usually it's not. Yeah. So I don't want to give away too much in that. I mean, if you guys want to see that, it's in the community. Uh, shout out to John, uh, who said, do you believe jokes hold background merit? My girl makes jokes about only having me around for my things, but says it's just a joke. Red flag. What do you think to that, man? That's a good question. Oh, actually, I've got a good story on this one. I was going to say it yesterday. My grandfather, he was a Baptist minister and a farmer. It's like 80 years old. His name's Romeo. Awesome, man. The sweetest man on earth. Never said an unkind word about anybody. He had that. He was a black guy. He had that slow, like Southern drawl to him. He was just a wonder. And I remember once my grandma was out. Elnora was out with uh, all of our family. We have like 20 aunts and uncles. And he had to stay home for whatever reason. And they were making him a goodie bag. And they had one for the dog and one for him. And then they made a joke. And it I never really liked it where she was talking about, oh, he is such a nice man. We'd give him the dog goodie bag by accident. He'd probably still eat it and thank us. Mm -hmm. I just don't, I don't, I don't like those kind of jokes. And I can't articulate why yet. I'll tell you why, because I think there's always some truth to every joke. The reason why stand stand up comics are so fucking funny is because the stuff that they poke at, <clears throat> you know, some say they flick boogers at certain, you know, demographics, yeah. but I mean, the things that they poke at, um, there's truth to everything. You know, the, like Chris Rock is an amazing comic. I love stand up comedy. I wish I had the talent for it, but I have. <laughs> I think that you've got more of the talent for it, if I'm being honest, because you're really funny up on stage. But um, yeah. <laughs> You know, to answer that question, is it a red flag? I wouldn't say it's like, you know, um, a, maybe a, a call to one. action. Yeah. But, you know, just just take note of it. And if you start to notice that, you know, red flags like this pile up, um, then, you know, you've got some thinking to do about it. But, uh, yeah, it's somewhat underhanded when women say that they're just around for your things. Um, again, you know, there's always see even Clarissa, you know, she's a woman. She says, yeah, there's always truth in a jest. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, that's the thing too. Like, don't it, John, do not go and start like running your mouth about how unfair this is and having a temper tantrum. Cause that'll be the worst thing you can do on that. Let's, let's talk about like, you know, shit that guys get wrong because you're like, I mean, you've been with your girl for how long? I think we're on 10 years now. Although 10? she was a plate before that I plated her when she was 19 and we never started dating till she was 20, 22, 23. I was oh, so about you 30. Plated her for about three years then. Yeah. Well, I had a deployment in between, so there was like a year there where I didn't have any plates, except for that one flight attendant from Oman, but that's a longer story, and that has nothing to do with the topic here. So, Got it. <laughs> so what do, what do you guys get really wrong far too often that's like, it seems so easy to you that they shouldn't be doing it? Oh, they're not honest. It's with... uh, it's any anything. Like, if you want something, and then you act completely in, in opposition to that. So let's say... And this is like a standard thing. A married red pill guy would come into the sub first thing. And after his little hazing, he would always have the same thing. Like, I want my wife to fuck me. That's what I want. And so you'd kind of give him some actionable advice. Well, okay, well, fine. Be a man worth fucking, you know, get working out, drop your weight and then stop being codependent. Those are like the two biggest, easiest things. But then they start kind of fighting you on it. And you're like, well, why are you fighting? And then it turns out it's because they don't want to fuck her. They want her to validate them. And so what they actually, they don't actually know what they actually want. And because they're kind of bullshitting themselves with this, well, I just want sex like an alpha male when in reality, they need to kill their codependence, but they are searching for codependence. That's that children with dynamite thing. Mm -hmm. And so the way they act is the bullshit excuse they give. It's congruent with that, but it's not congruent with what they actually want. And it was almost like clockwork. There was a good percentage of the, of the guys who at the two year mark, when they finally realized that they've been chasing, you know, chasing shadows this whole time. And they're like, Oh, I just realized I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I've been bullshitting myself for two years. And I'd say 100%. The second biggest thing we do is every guy assumes that the ring gives you some kind of special sexual powers. Yeah, it doesn't. I see that a lot where guys just relax and they're like, okay, I've, you know, I've cashed out my chips. I've said I do, you know, forever and ever until death do us part and sickness and health and richer and yeah. poorer and blah, blah, blah. Pull like, some overtime at work and she'll have gratitude and fuck me. Like it's not how it works. Yeah, it, it it doesn't, right? And I and I don't really know why, you know, why that is. I mean, really, maybe if people you know want to get married, maybe the vow should be, you know, in richness, you know, for richer, but definitely not for poor, dumbass. So make sure you don't <laughs> screw up. Um, yeah, and it's the thing too. Like they're good at 
they're good at usually those kind of guys are really great at working. Like the plow horse is an awesome plow horse, but, and they double down on that because, well, I'm good at this so I can be better at that. It'll make me feel good. Even though this shit in my life here is horrible. So instead of actually dealing with the things you're not good at, mm -hmm. it's easier to kind of coddle yourself, blame her for being a bitch, but I'm a really great employee. Why doesn't she fuck me? It's like a, we'd rather, we'd rather wallow in our own, in our own uh, self misery than actually do something about it and admit our ego is not our friend. Yeah. But yeah. So, but it's much easier to say just stepping on your dick and analyzing the footprint. So I go with that. <laughs> yeah. There's uh, you know, Jeff said, uh, said over here in the comments, the ring sucks the sex out of it. Unless as Richard says, you do the work like you, like, the thing that dudes don't get, in my opinion, is that it's it's probably harder to have a successful and fulfilling long and lower risk uh, marriage or long term relationship than it is just to date, you know, or just to spin plates. Like, and and you know, as my <laughs> I'm not going to say his name, but as my buddy likes to say, and your reward for that is the same chick you've had for the last ten years, mm -hmm. right? So I don't know. So married married red pill stuff. Married red oh, pill yeah. stuff. What sort of coaching do you do? Like, what do you usually specialize in? Uh, the specialty there is is just like what I said, being able to set honest goals and get through your ego. I found the one gift I had, and it's weird that I'm such a, a controversial figure on Reddit at all. Mm -hmm. But I guess, uh, is there a term? You know, it's called narcissistic injury. Do you know what this is? No, what is it? Uh, so you know how the narcissist essentially treats himself as his own one-act play. Like, he's the one-man play. Everything else is a set piece. The wife's mm -hmm. a set piece, whatever. If you go, uh, like, if you don't acknowledge that narrative, the only reaction that, that somebody can have to that is, is rage. Mm -hmm. And so if you're in, essentially calling out somebody's bullshit. So if you're the guy who's, I've been the greatest plow horse ever, why won't my wife desire me? And it's well, because you're a fat fuck and you're unattractive and no other girl wants to fuck you. So why would she? That kind of hits to the guy's core. The same as like those uh, dad jokes holding merit or whatever about only liking around for his things. Mm -hmm. So that kind of hits his, like in his mind, he thinks my wife truly desires me. But in the end, she just flat out said like, yeah, I like you because you get me a cool car. And so that narcissistic rage is kind of the thing I like addressing at the core, because once you hit that, guys kind of bypass all their bullshit rationalizations and then they can get to real work. The hard part there is then you got to define goals because guys make really, and I'm not going to, not shitting on your goal here because I know where it's coming from, but a lot of guys will repeat your, be the best man possible. But mm. then they don't really articulate what that means. So whatever they do is the best man possible. So I the the big approach I take to that is focusing on what the guy actually want. And sometimes the goals aren't very politically correct. Sometimes a guy just hates his wife, but he doesn't want to lose his kids, and he need he thinks they're better off with him there than him not there. And do you so find maybe it, he just wants plates on the side, like to have sex? Do you find it hard to call people out on their shit? I don't find it hard. I do find the bans and the aftermath to be kind of annoying. <laughs> What do you mean the bans in the aftermath? Well, I got a lot of hate from Reddit. I've actually had a few temporary bans in the past. But oh, it's bans. The exact same okay. thing. Yeah. yeah. It's it's hard in the sense that you just know you're going to get shit on for it. But I mean, I'm comfortable being the asshole. I'm not really that much of an asshole, but I'll take it. I don't mind it. I mean, like I see people like complicate their lives. Yeah. Okay. So here's a good example. I've got a guy that's in my community. He pays 10 bucks a month to be in my community to get access to the premium content. He says in there, um, you know, I have this basically a, a minimum wage paying job and I'm considering getting into this trade, uh, which would pay me double. Uh, but I'm scared to leave the job that I have because I'm comfortable in it. And it's like, I just come right out. I'm like, look, don't be a pussy. And then I just keep, you know, keep going from there. Right. Yeah. And it's like, Sometimes you have to say uncomfortable truths to people for them to, you know, get that they need to wake the hell up. We got some comments here. Let's let's hit on those. Uh, did Ryan dodge a bullet of his girl cheating while he was playing in the sandbox? I'm not sure what Dan means by that. Did your did your chick cheat on you? No, or? that had nothing to do with the deployment. And we're out in the ocean. We don't have a sandbox. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Clarissa says, I think men feel more masculine and successful when they know they are satisfying their girl in the bedroom. It takes communication and vulnerability from both parties i don't like it when when women tell men to be vulnerable and to communicate like that's the standard you yeah. know that's the whole um well jack like had a, it perfect well that's like an attraction cue it's not yeah. an arousal cue like like it's like being a good communicator or vulnerable is not going to give her the gina tingles 
Um, you know, but it might be like an attractive trait, which is what they sort of talk about. It's kind of like how they get it in their dating profiles yeah. where they'll list all these attraction cues, like, you know, must be this tall, must have a job, must not live at parents' house, you know, whatever. Must um, be like, able to brag about you during brunch with the girls. Yeah, but she won't come straight out and say, you know, must look sexy as, as, as hell naked, you know, after you get out of the shower or anything like that, because that's just wrong. Right. But let's be honest, you know, um, women, women on their swiping habits from dating apps, we know from studies only swipe on something like 20% of the men on there. So, uh, you know, they are just as critical as men are. Oh, Clarissa is talking some more here. What is she saying? Some guys, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why guys, but that made me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> some guys are horrible in bed and un unwilling to learn. I don't know. I don't know, no man. Guys, like, no guy, no guy is horrible in bed because if a girl wants to get off and she's mentally in that place, she will. Yeah. Um, it's not that he's bad in bed. It's maybe he's bad in seducing you. Yeah. Maybe he's bad in seducing, you know, maybe his, you know, he, he's got ED or something like that, or he's, he, he doesn't look that good when he's naked. Um, but I mean, most guys, I don't know, man, we're not 19 anymore. You know, you should be, you know, you should know what you're fucking doing by the time you're a grown adult, if I'm being honest. Uh, then women I mean, you've had, I'm assuming every of us have had sex before with a girl that wasn't 100% into it, but she kind of was to go along. And it's never that good for her. But when a yeah. girl's really into it, the sex is always good. So it's clear yeah. it's more about what's in her head than our performance. I mean, short of like erectile dysfunction and stupid stuff like that. Yeah. Um, no woman needs to talk and be open with her man. And most women don't know how. Yeah, I don't know. You know, um, what do you think of uh, women's love advice? I'm curious about your opinion there. It's when you're more focused on getting validation from the crowd, you're never going to be able to be 100% honest. I don't think there's a girl alive that'd be willing to ruin her reputation with her friends by being honest with them. You think women are dishonest with their friends? I think I think they're politely, politely dishonest in order to keep the 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 bond alive between people they're more worried on keeping people together than they are on actually fixing things or solving problems or telling people the truth i agree with that yeah yeah, yeah. so you yeah, and you can't really like all you're going to be able to get then is just sugar-coated bullshit at that point because they can't put yeah. themselves on the on the yeah they can't put themselves out there and risk that rejection by giving somebody honest advice that makes the other person lash out which is true because they will lash out yeah um okay let's go back to some of these note questions i've got over here what time we got 12 45 we're probably gonna go we said till about three right i think so yeah yeah 2 45 okay um answer this question for me when you were growing up what did you want to be like when you were a kid <laughs> 10 11 12 years old and you're like damn i want to i want to be an astronaut like for me like i wanted to, be I a wanted to test pilot. video games <laughs> really <laughs> I, had, I just got my super nintendo man it was awesome this is like life's dream for me you know what the funny thing is? Is there's is there's kids out there that are multimillionaires playing video games too right now. I remember when I was a kid, like I used to play the Sega Genesis or whatever video game console we had out yeah, there. Yeah, you look like a Genesis guy. Uh, Choplifter and Mortal Kombat and all that stuff. <laughs> um, you know, and I was like, ah, this is fun. This is awesome. And I, you know, my parents, you know, especially my mom, constantly told me, "You're going to be retarded if you keep doing this." You know, all your life, you you know, you have to do other things. Look at so and so. Um, and lo and behold, there's, you know, there's teenagers now that are making, you know, multiple millions of dollars per year playing video games professionally. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. I don't, yeah, I, I kind of, I've never really been one of those, I want X. I've been more of one of those, I don't want X kind of guys. So yeah. for example, when I was that age, my biggest goal was to never be in my shitty small town again and never be caught working at the mill with some fat wife that I met in high school. Where did you grow up? Uh, a small town in the North Thompson in uh in, in british columbia there maybe three thousand people and you were raised by a single mom too right well she was divorced well yeah she was divorced when i was three uh she was a single mom till about five and then we moved from edmonton alberta to bc about five five and a half and the guy he worked up in the bush maybe 16 hours a day so it might as well have been a single mom at that point mm. and um what happened to your dad he <laughs> he was a gambler he was, he had the silver tongue. He was like what you think of, of like a, a playboy. He'd basically be like uh, Christian McQueen back in the seventies. Oh, okay. So a cat then. And here's the thing though. So once, once Evan and I got old enough to go to school, she ditched that right away. So obviously, and I, I noticed that when you were talking, I think it was you yesterday talking about the seven to 10 year itch. Mm -hmm. 
And I've noticed this right around that age that everybody, every girl seems to get divorced right when she doesn't have to stay at home all day with the kids. And I'm starting to wonder if there's a, a biological aspect to that. I'll tell you what I think it is. Cause I've noticed this, um, after I got divorced and you know, when you're, how old is I? 39, 38, 39. Um, and like every, every woman that I had met at that time was also either divorced or, or separated for the most part. Cause like an idiot, I was, I was dating my own age range. Um, <laughs> I should have dated younger, but you know, the stories were always that they got divorced around, you know, the time the kids were seven or eight or nine, you know, usually, usually between seven and 10. Um, and it was for the same reason, you know, they're in grade one or two, they're self-sufficient, they can put on their clothes, they can wipe their own ass. And they just seem to find like an easy way for that to work for them. Um, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Oh, look, we got a super chat here from Bear. Thanks for that, dude. Uh, any thoughts on women coming off birth control and falling out of love, destroying marriages, kids, lives, etc.? I'm not sure I'm clear on that. Do you know what he means by that? If you I'm can just sure. clarify in the notes. Like, I don't really have any thoughts on it. Same way as I don't have thoughts about physics. I just know it's a thing and I deal with it. I mean, I mean, the thing about hormonal birth control is it, is it does mess chicks up. Um, yeah. Like it, like it changes. But that's just it. Why aren't IUDs bigger? You'd think so. But women also say that IUDs are not that good for you either. I mean, it's plastic with copper wire in you. But I mean, as far as I know, they're effective. I mean, I had a girlfriend on an IED at one time. Um, and it's, you know, like it works. So I'm not really yeah. sure. And I don't um, see women being awkward about having a bunch of electronics and plastic up to their face all day. I mean, that's what the cell phone is. It's the only difference well, they, is it's an innie, not an Audi. Well, they certainly have no problem with, you know, vibrators and the like, right? Like, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> um, Hormonally, I though, I can see that being a big mind fuck. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that for sure. The hormone stuff. Yeah. We have a, we have a new member. Uh, welcome, Mary Ellen Sloat. I don't know why that name sounds familiar. She says, this is yeah, probably yeah, the yeah. most woman I've ever seen in one of these like masculine podcasts ever, ever. Interesting. So apparently you're a charmer. I guess. <laughs> uh, so let's charm them a little bit more. So guys, the way that this works with the chat now, if you've just joined is um, I got tired of playing whack-a-mole, dealing with the um, troll commenters, deleting their comments and getting distracted while I'm trying to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So what I did was I basically uh, set this up now so that you have to be a community member to comment. Um, so there you have it. If you want to join the community conversation or ask a question or make a super chat or whatever, you know, you can do it that way. So that's the way that works. Um, so we got you for about another 15 more minutes. Uh, I emailed you. She said, I'm not sure what you emailed me. Was it a, was it a question or a sponsored video? Let me know. There. Photo? Sliding into them DMS. Don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Uh, what yeah, did you I, can yeah. I ask oh, you, do you have a yeah. point there? I was going to ask you a question if we got some free time. Go for it. Yeah. So how long have you been in YouTube now for a couple, like you've been doing this for a couple of years. Did you notice that uh, it kind of, it was just a slow, steady progression from there until now? Or did you hit some kind of wall where you realized there was something really holding you back? And then once you've done it, it kind of gave you those no. exponential gains. No, you know what happened? Um, I got, so I was up at Collingwood for my Entrepreneurs Org retreat. I remember this now. So my first video I did with my buddy, Brad. And he was in my forum at the time. Uh, you know, he owned this uh, toy company. So he had this uh, big ass pickup truck. He used to toy uh, or trailer around his, his boat, his motorcycle and stuff like that. With So we did this video in the um, the truck and I was just shooting the shit. Like, tell me about your entrepreneurial journey and what you did. And I'm driving the Hemi and just, you know, beating the shit out of it. <laughs> um, and I and I did that for a couple of years, not thinking, hey, maybe I should turn this into a business. But it but it really only like like if I look at my analytic chart and it's this long from here to here, yeah. uh, at least from here to about here. So about two thirds of the way through, I had no views. Um, and it wasn't until I started being attentive to people asking me questions, like they were emailing me or there's, they were uh, like direct messaging me certain questions that might've related to like a prior video or maybe something they thought I could be useful on. I'm like, I'm getting a lot of questions. So people are obviously thinking that I know something. So <laughs> maybe, well, idiots. <laughs> You know, it's like, um, it's like, well, duh, you know, <laughs> yeah. so, okay. Um, I do coaching. So why don't we set up a coaching profile? And I started doing that and I kind of built it from there and added a community component to it. And, you know, now we talk at the 21 convention and we're able to connect with, uh, guys over there and it, it's great, man. Like, I love it. Like, I think like, to me, this is the best job I've ever had. I've, I've done a lot of shit. Like I've yeah. done a lot of manual labor. I've done a lot of office jobs. Same. Um, you know, I've worked as a, auto mechanic and co-op in high school. I've planted uh, trees and uh, sh close to Chapleau. Oh, you were a tree you know. planner? Oh yeah. I, I, <laughs> You're um, not French though. 
No, dude, I did. Um, I did the uh, Junior Ranger program, which was uh, coined the year that I joined it, the Ontario Ranger program. And uh, cool. they basically take like a bunch of city kids and they ship them up north, like you know, six hours away on a fucking train, and they make you do like uh, you know hard ass labor for below minimum wage because they have like a local native lady that that cooks your breakfast, so they do like room and board in these trailers. Mm -hmm. And then you're off uh, cutting weevils out of trees or you're planting trees or you're clearing portage trails. I remember we were fucking doing this portage trail one week and coming back, there was this horrible rainstorm and we were on this like nasty raft uh, that was barely held together by like, I don't know, like a staple gun. And we had all of our gear on it and all these tired kids were all 16 years old. We're just lying here pouring rain like a fucking hurricane and the thing's sinking as we're crossing the fucking lake because it's taking up so much water and i'm like is this how we're gonna die you know these four 16 year old kids on this raft are gonna die and drown. that's awesome oh, man, dude that's so all that's like one of the original canadian jobs working up by the hudson bay clearing brush oh we were we were stupid you know how dumb we were some some kid came up with the idea that if you dried potato skins and uh rolled them up in a joint you could smoke them and get high so we're a bunch oh, that of actually works i don't know so <laughs> we're a bunch of 16 year old retards and um you know so one kid while he was peeling potatoes he kept the skins and set them aside and they were dry so a week later we figured okay let's go to the gym because we had this gym there it was this shitty brown you know ontario ministry of natural resources hut with like a bench press and like one dumbbell oh, and yeah. um one of the um one of the amin guys was working out in there and we're and we're talking about rolling up our potato joint and getting high in the gym and uh he, he caught us and he called the opp and then we got interrogated by the opp what over the potato skins <laughs> they were going to ship us away they were going to ship us Jeez. back home holy crap talk I've about done a lot of a, shit. talk yeah. about taking a five minute fucking chastising and turning it into a national emergency jesus yeah. i do you know, like I've done a lot of stuff. So, you know, it's been fun to take all of those experiences, like all those little, you know, notches, those little paper cuts and being able to, uh, you know, share stories and ideas. Yeah. Cause it, cause it creates contrast and perspective and frame too. I think that's why you're so likable. It's, I've never seen anybody who's done hard manual labor and not been likable, especially mm -hmm. when like shit hits the fan, but it's not really big shit. You can always tell because they've got big hands. Like they've got, They've got mitts for hands, like like, <laughs> like guys. That, oh yeah, like you know, if they've been in the trades, you know, for their entire lives, and they're sixty years old, when you shake a man's hand that's been doing manual labor, it's like a fucking baseball glove, right? Yeah. Like it's like hard leather and it's thick, right? Um, you know, it's one of the things that I notice. I mean, you can always tell somebody's done any hard labor in their life by the state of their hands. Mm -hmm. Well, that's uh, good because my arthritis from the car accident. <laughs> I can't grip for <laughs> shit anymore. I got like a feminine handshake. It's brutal. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I almost okay, so, like okay, I so lost just two fist fingers. They cut it down see. right there. Yeah. Um, let me ask you a couple more questions before we wrap up because we got to do a um, Red Man Light Group Patreon only. Lightning round. Let's go. Lightning round. So, um, okay, here's one for you. What business lesson did you learn the hard way, and how can you help others avoid your mistake? That nobody gives a shit about merit; they give a shit about networking. Uh, for other people to avoid that, I'd say. Yeah, you've really just got to start seeing people who who get by off of uh, personality and who they know. You got to learn it the hard way. I can't think of like a shortcut to it. Okay. And what would you consider a defining moment in your life? Like a real milestone for you, like an epoch? That's a, ah, that's a good one. I have to take a second here to think. I would say... Outside of the Straits of Hormuz, when our ship was picking up, or when, oh, no, this one, Horn of Africa. We're down there, and we get a mayday call from some cruise liner. They're getting chased by pirates. So we had picked up the thing. We had done uh, a radar check for their distance. They were 300 nautical miles away. Now, for those that don't know, that our ship maxes out at about 30 knots. So that's 30 miles an hour. It's a 10-hour traversal. Now, by maritime law, when you accept the call, you're obliged to go assist them. And so the captain was so excited that he got his cocktail party story of being able to save people from pirates that he jumps on there while we're trying to tell him like, sir, sir, you can't do that. We're 10 hours away. We'll never catch him. He accepts the call. And then once he gets off the horn again, he kind of, it sinks in that we basically, I think we've basically gotten this cruise ship fucked. Nobody mm -hmm. else is going to come to save him now and we're too far away for anything. 
So we eventually sent out the helicopter, had to strip it of anything other than like a C7, like an M16, basically, to go mm -hmm. fight off these pirates. It eventually went okay. The thing fishtailed and the guys lost interest and fucked off. And the news story the next day was about how we fought pirates and won from CNN of all places. <laughs> and I will put that as my life-changing event because it kind of, like, it's really hard to take life seriously after something like that. Right. I really had, and it was that, it was up at that point when I kind of realized, like, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> it's, so I can't even, yeah, I just. So it, so it, so it takes a Canadian naval vessel 10 hours to cover 300 miles. Yeah. Is that, is that quick? Is uh, 30 knots quick for a naval vessel? It's pretty or? quick. It's not the fastest. I know some of those uh, American ones that really have a lot, like I think the aircraft carriers can do 45, but like, you're not going to see much that can go past 60. So it's, there isn't a Navy in the world who would have accepted that Mayday call at that distance, mm -hmm. unless you had a fighter jet on, but you're not going to fun to fight a pirate with a fighter jet anyway. But I mean, the helicopter's got a 300, 300 mile range. <laughs> it barely? had just enough range once we stripped all the ammo and weapons and all the weight off of it to make it out there but not back so we had to race to make it back close enough that it could land on us without crashing into the ocean oh so you had to close the distance as it was flying out there yeah pretty much it was like but all of this because everybody had like they wanted to be the big hero so bad that like against all better sense we did it and nothing not only did nothing happen but the story that went home was that we were fucking heroes <laughs> and I just, I, so did we kill any pirates that day or no, we There's never no... even saw the guy. He ran off. <laughs> he took off already. <laughs> I don't think it was because of us either. I'm pretty sure we were too far away for him to see. <laughs> he was, he was, he was chewing on his gnat or whatever it's called thinking, oh shit, here comes the Canadians. Yeah. And it was, I've never really had pride for my job after that moment. <laughs> so I think that was a life changing one. And yeah. I've had started to get it again now in this space. So it took a yeah. while. If you could do it all over again, what would you do differently? Yeah, I can't think of anything. Um, I probably would have started, uh, had my fuck you, fuck this moment a little earlier because that 14 months was pretty hellish. When was the fuck you moment? The fuck you moment was the time when I had the interview with the MPs and I realized they hadn't okay. done any work. Actually, I can name that the exact question I was asked. She asked me, is there anything else you've done that we should be aware of? And I remember looking back, it was my biggest CSI tough guy moment I've ever had where I'm like, I'm not here to do your fucking job for you. <laughs> so I'm just sitting there like the tough guy leaning back in the chair, talking to the cops. I'm like, holy fuck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, I would have done that. I would have done that conversation much sooner, much sooner. All right. Let's, um, let's start to wrap it up because um, I got to get on with Rolo and Anthony in about 20 minutes. Um, where can people find you? What are you working on? Social media stuff. Why is Ryan Stone the dude to be followed? Oh, Ryan Stone's the dude to be followed because he's that authentic male that actually speaks honestly, same as Rich. Basically, if you like Rich with more hair and a little shorter. Yeah, I know. Maybe Facebook. a little bit of a tan. And then the places to find me, the big one are my website, ryanstone.com. If you sign up to nothing else, sign up to the newsletter. That's ryanstone.com slash newsletter. Six days a week, I give out the kind of information that Rich does in his private chats here. It's things that'll get you banned from social media. It's very honest conversation things that you can learn from my life that'll help you achieve your dreams sexually, professionally, whatever. Uh, aside from that, I got the YouTube channel. I'm not big enough yet where I get to name it uh, Ryan Stone or anything like that. So if you go to ryanstone.com slash YouTube, it'll automatically link you to the channel as well as Patreon, Patreon underscore Ryan underscore Stone. That's where I'm setting up two things here for the new year. So it's going to be in about a week and a half. After the Red Man group, I'm going to have another private podcast afterwards for a half hour now, but we'll see how it goes. So for five bucks a month, you can see a lot of the concepts that we kind of gloss over during our weekly podcast, and so we can go into it with more depth. Because I don't know if you guys know this, but when Rich is just saying a quick little one-liner, there's about a book of knowledge behind that. And so this is the place where we kind of expand on those things. If you up it to $50 a month for the Patreon, I'm actually going to do group coaching. So it's the same thing I do with my one-on-one -on -one clients. But if you don't want to pay the 300 a month, you can come in there for 50 and we do it in more of a group setting. It's obviously going to be a little more toned down and less personal, but it's still an amazing amount of value. And the last thing on you can find me on there is Twitter, underscore Ryan, underscore Stone, where I give little tidbits of info, same as Rich. And Instagram, underscore Ryan, underscore Stone, where I can give you little visual, visual lessons on style, on cooking, on life, on travel. 
I'm basically everywhere at this point. I think I killed like two minutes for that answer, Rich. Yeah, no worries, man. And um, <laughs> you're going to be on the Red Man Group on Saturday too, right? For the Damn straight, the year, year review. Round. Yeah, so the year in review, uh, there'll probably be a fairly large panel on. So check it out Saturday at 10 a.m. We'll be on for two hours, maybe a little bit longer. We'll see how it goes. Um, but yeah, man, thanks for joining joining me today. Um, you know, make sure you're subscribed and you hit the notification bell because what I'm going to try to do is get through a lot of the 21 convention speakers and you know some of these great men that I've met over the last couple of years that I think have a lot of interesting uh, things to share or say and you know they're putting their own little dent in the universe so hmm. give Ryan a, a follow on YouTube I just linked his new channel uh, new member shout out to Jim Smith thanks for joining the, uh, the YouTube chat community thing there and um, yeah I got to get ready for the next call with um, Rollo and Anthony at 3.30. So if you if you guys are watching this and you want to catch up on some Q&A, uh, I may set it up so that you guys can call in. I've got a, a call-in system. So we might do it as either Q&A in the comments or on a uh, call-in sort of fashion. So we'll see you guys there. All right. Thanks, brother. <laughs> Thank you. It's been a blast. All right. Done.